right, so World War II has left many examples of landscapes that were transformed due to exploitation and processing of fossil fuels. And in my opinion, one among the more interesting cases are relics of large synthetic fuel plants that were built by Nazi Germany at the end of 1930s, at the very beginning of 1940s. Those sophisticated installations were later bombarded, targeted by intensive Allied bombardment, especially since the middle of 1945. And in the post-war reality, no attempts have been made to restore them, rebuild them and restart production. Uh, they were seen as obsolete, even though they were very sophisticated and expensive, because uh, the production costs, their operational costs were very high and uh, they had relatively low productivity. But to understand where this idea came from, the idea to produce liquid fuel from coal, first we need to look at the historical context. So. Uh, at the end of 1930s, about 90% of the energy consumed in Nazi Germany was produced from coal, and it was no different in other countries uh, of Europe at the time. But when we compare the productivity of liquid fuels, here where it gets very interesting. So in 1938, a year before the war in Europe broke down, Nazi Germany produced 7 million tons of liquid fuels. Uh, Great Britain, its future enemy, 12 million tons. Uh, the Soviet Union, its uh, ally at the time and soon its little enemy, 29 million tons, and the United States of America, 164 million tons. So this situation was seen by uh, Nazi authorities as an obstacle, as a danger to overcome, especially that uh, most of the liquid fuels at the time were produced in Nazi Germany from crude oil, crude oil that was brought from overseas. And it was obvious that uh, in the case of imminent war in Europe, those supplies will be cut off. And uh, the coal, coal was uh, only raw resource which was abundant in, uh, in Germany. In fact, uh, regarding uh, raw materials, uh, Nazi Germany was self-sufficient only. Um, in coal. And another thing is that um, if we look at the productivity of the United States, it means that uh, only in 1938 the United States produced more liquid fuels than Nazi Germany during five years of this atrocious war. So that's where this idea about production of liquid fuels from coal came from. Um, I will focus today only on one example. Like I said, there are many cases of uh, such uh, facilities, uh, such uh, plants. I will focus on the Hydrierwerke Politz. Uh, the site was uh, built, uh, the construction started in 1938 and it was finished on 15th of July 1940. It means that that was the day when the production of liquid, fuel, of liquid fuels uh, began. Um, far away from the future front lines and the nearest uh, airfields, uh, Hydrierwerke Polit seemed to be relatively safe. Uh, right now it's located in northwestern part of Poland, but before the war it was uh, Nazi territory, it was Nazi um, Germany. Uh, the plant itself had um, quite good logistics, like it was very well connected uh, with sea through Szczecin Lagoon and it was also supplied through other river and other waterways with coal from that were coming from distant Silesian mines. And of course production could be also transported in that way using the waterways. Ah. Something broken. Okay, so first um, let's look at the general context of the site before uh, we'll see the plant itself. Uh, so when we analyze aerial photographs that were taken by eight, uh, eight um, US eight uh, Air Force, um, we will see that on the other river there are a large number of coal barges. They're going down the river flow to deliver the coal to the uh, factory, and especially there is a large number of them at the uh, photographs taken during the early stages of the war, and they are everywhere omnipresent on those busy waterways at the time. Um, so uh, several uh, coal terminals were built on the stretching way, uh, where the barges were unloaded, uh, coal was stored, and then later it was moved to the railway cars, and in that matter, manner it was transported uh, to the factory. And all bigger railway junctions at the time are either full of uh, coal um, railway cars or um, tanks that 
deliver uh, the production from the factory to the front or to other uh, places. As I said uh, before, the um, factory was built 10 kilometers to the north from Stettin city, and it was the biggest city at the time, the most industrialized, uh, industrialized city of the region, so there were some larger and smaller businesses, all of them turned already to military production. So, for example, there were steelworks, but there were also shipyards, there were several automotive companies, uh, there was large factory that produced engines for Junkers aeroplanes, so many, many uh, endeavors that were producing for military uh, pro uh, requirements, uh, needs. Uh, so when we look at the aerial photographs uh, on the Stettin Harbor, uh, the harbor was located in the heart of Stettin itself, because like uh, any other historical city, other river just runs through the city, through the heart of this uh, old part of the city. So when we look at the early photographs, we will see that lots of warships, Creeks Marina warships are um, undergoing some reparation works uh, in the floating docks. <clears throat> there are some U-boats, some of the warships are waiting to be uh, refueled with a freshly produced diesel in the Hydrierwerke uh, police. Oh, that's, for example, uh, a shipyard, a Vulcan shipyard, famous that because it produced, uh, it built uh, U-boats. There are two U-boats, Finnish and two others. Uh, under construction. All of those places, all of those sites were targeted later in the final stages of the war by intensive bombardment and raised to the ground together with the old historical part of the city and its amazing historical architecture. So in this uh, matter, we, we can say uh, that uh, aerial photographs allows us to analyze, to interpret, to name the historical role of the places that do not exist anymore, that were never rebuilt because they were destroyed and no attempts have been made to rebuild them. And they allow us also to understand relations of those places that I often put in a distant, uh, in the large distances, and they are related uh, through their function in this case, function of supplying Hydrierwerke police. At the very beginning of the building of factory, only three workers were employed and they were drawn by um, subcontractors from different European countries. But soon after the beginning of the conquest of Poland in 1939, a large number of slave laborers started to come and they were keep coming. So uh, labor camps were built around the site, around the factory, which was here, um, to accommodate those newcomers. And soon they became the largest working force uh, in, the, uh, in the factory. And obviously we know that from eyewitnesses accounts that uh, the, the conditions were very difficult, that uh, prisoners were dying from overwork, from malnutrition, uh, from frequent executions, from accident and so on. So this history is no different. In this case, aerial photographs, historical aerial photographs allows us to find the, the exact location of those former labor camps as soon after the war they were demolished and later on they were overbuilt by modernistic block of flats. So uh, the memory about them just disappeared. But there's much more obviously to tell about, to say about those camps uh, than only to point out their location. When you look at the photographs from the later stages of war, you may see that many bombs drifted or were just by mistake dropped on those camps and prisoners were dying and later on those prisoners were, who survived were used to disarm unexploded bombs. It, was often, it is often mentioned. This is, for example, Pommernlager, which was uh, um, largely destroyed, in the larger part destroyed during one of the bombardments and we can see burnt barracks and some bomb craters around. That's one of the penalty camps where uh, prisoners that tried to escape to, were kept and that's, for example, joint uh, branch of uh, Ravensbrück and uh, Stutthof concentration camps. The prisoners were also used for hard labor in uh, Hydrierwerke Polits. Um, so, on the 5th of September 1940, there was a first ride undertaken by, by RAF aeroplanes. The results were moderate, but it became clear that the uh, plant is not safe anymore. Uh, it was just less than two months after the initiation of fuel production, by the way. 
So uh, some countermeasures have been taken to protect the site. For example, large number of uh, smoke generators were built uh, around the uh, uh, plant to cover it. Um, more, many of them survived until the present day. You can see how they worked. That's B-24 liber Liberator flying over Polizia. Um, and But due to analysis, based on analysis of aerial photographs from the era, we may say that uh, the production of smoke was never sufficient enough to cover the whole uh, facility and hide it from the eyes of Allied bombardiers. So uh, you can often see some places, and of course, gas was, uh, those um, uh, smoke screens were also dependent on the strength of wind and, their dire and its direction and so on. Um, uh, those uh, smoke uh, generators emitted uh, highly toxic, po uh, poisonous, um, acidus gases, so they were devastating for natural environment. And here you can see that they're not working, but the vegetation around them is burned by, this acidus, by those acidus uh, gases. Uh, obviously, also camouflage netting was used, but it, its efficiency was not good enough. We can see tanks and this uh, type of netting uh, could not be used uh, over all installations of the plant. Um, um, and uh, to protect the site, uh, there, was, uh, large num there was a large number of barrage balloons, balloon balloons used, so that's balloon. Uh, they were put around the plant uh, from the late 1940s uh, to the late 1943. After that time, they disappeared because it became clear that, uh, they, uh, that uh, aeroplanes, Allied aeroplanes at the time were flying at the high altitudes, far beyond the reach of those barrage balloons, so there was no point to keep them. In fact, they posed the threat only to so-called pathfinders, aeroplanes like the Havilland mosquitoes that were flying to mark targets, dropping flares on those targets just before uh, the beginning of the air rise. Ah, another feature interesting here is the tank, tank for gas uh, for those balloons. Um, another way of building creating destruction for Allied pilots was uh, building uh, mock-ups, mock uh, fake raffineries in the distance of 10 kilometers to the north and uh, northwest from the factory. Three such mock-ups were built. I will focus only on one because two others are very similar um, cases. So the f here where the thing starts getting very interesting because uh, those mock-ups were regularly photographed by Americans months after months after months and when I compare those photographs, I don't see any signs of destruction, like not a single bomb was dropped on them. But we got obviously modern technologies. Uh, this is the same place. So as you can see, the area was not transformed. It's still in the forest. The difference is, is, is that the mock-up is just overgrown. So here, when we use airborne laser scanning derivatives, we'll see that the fence around the mock-up is very well preserved. We can actually see the subtle relics of this mock-up. We'll also see uh, the uh, relics of uh, anti-aircraft artillery emplacements, some trenches, some uh, other emplacements here and here, but there's not a single bomb crater there. If single bomb was dropped there, or if even single bomb was dropped them there, then we would see relics of those bombs. But for some reason, uh, they were avoided. Uh, they were quite easy to, those mock-ups were quite easy to recognize during the daytime, that's obvious, but during the nighttime, nighttime reportedly, Germans were using uh, different uh, light effects to draw the attention, but uh, as it seems, it did not uh, really work. And in the two other cases of the mock-ups, the situation is exactly uh, the same. Uh, obviously, the main core of defense was uh, anti-aircraft artillery emplacement, and quite interesting thing, the number of guns used to protect the facility was the same as the number of guns used to protect Berlin. So it shows the strategic meaning of the uh, liquid fuels production, especially at the end uh, of, the, of, the, of the war. Um, okay, we will not focus on this image because there is a lot to be said and interpreted from this image. It would take another hour or so. Um, uh, I will just say that uh, many of those emplacements, uh, Air Force survive until the present day and can be registered with uh, with airborne laser scanning. So all those uh, 
um, all, all, all those banks that were built to protect not only guns, but also Würzburg radars and search finders and search lights and barracks and generators and so on. Uh, many of them survived uh, and, and then can be still uh, studied. We are in the very good conditions. Um, the term bombscape is often used by archaeologists interested in modern con in studies of modern conflict to describe the landscape that was transformed by intensive bombardment. And that's also the case uh, when we look at the Hydrierwerke police. Uh, many of bombs were dropped not only uh, on the facility itself, but as I said, on the labor camps and also on the nearby villages, devastating natural environment, killing people and destroying whole villages uh, up to a point that they were never rebuilt again. They were just overbuilt together with developing uh, city after the war, uh, together with growing population after the war. So the landscape was transformed uh, and changed. But not everywhere. Like this is area that is adjacent to the solve from the factory. Uh, it is still forested, and we can see using airborne laser scanning derivative that there is still large number of bomb craters that were dropped here. Even some trench uh, is there as well. And in the area where arable fields are present, we can also see the bomb craters as positive crop marks. So we are also clearly quite clearly visible um, aerial photographs from the era allows us also to study gradual destruction of the plant so we can see how the plant was gradually destroyed with every bombardment but we can also see um, last desperate efforts to repair damages damages and restart production and that's image from the uh, second half of 1944 which shows that it, the factory was almost completely destroyed and yet it still kept its production low level but it still produced some fuel something happened okay after the war um, the factory was completely devastated it was destroyed and it became an enclave of the red army so for several years after the war the red army was supervising the area uh, and it scavenged the site for valuable recyclable materials and metals and so on. And later the factory, the ruins of the factory were handed over um, to the Polish army. And uh, in 1990s, at the very beginning of 1990s, after the collapse of the communism, the, area, the uh, supervision, military supervision was lifted and the area was just opened and nobody cared about it. At, at the time, it became a kind of wicked upside down world where young people started to go, where some shady businesses started to happen, where police never went, where there were large party, organ uh, large illegal parties organized and so on. And you can imagine that, uh, yeah, th this would happen inside those places. Those visitors, those first visitors less of, lost, left lots of graffiti different types of graffiti, more and less interesting graffiti there. And right now the area is overgrown by vegetation and it became a habitat that is protected uh, within the Natura 2000 framework. So it's an animal habitat. And for example, if you go to one of the surviving air ride shelters and look at the selling, you will see thousands of scratches made by generations of bats that still live there and enjoy this place. Okay, and since the beginning of 2000s, uh, a kind of a turn to, in approach uh, to this place can be observed, more empathetic, more heritage oriented, more, more oriented on victimhood. Uh, it happened together with establishment of SCARP Association, which was established by uh, local history enthusiasts and those people started to care about the site. site. They rented uh, two uh, air ride shelters and one of those shelters is used as an exhibition room to commemorate uh, the difficult fate of slave workers, while the other uh, air ride shelter is used just to show some militaria that were found around the site after uh, the war. Uh, some uh, information boards were installed and uh, there are also some guided tours among the ruins of the Hydrierwerke police, even though some of those ruins are quite dangerous. So to, to conclude what I presented to you, 
uh, today. Uh, I don't want really to, to repeat uh, some ideas that were already written in many uh, scientific uh, papers about historical aerial photographs. So we know all the cognitive potential of those photographs. So just uh, just shortly, I will mention some of the ideas. So archaeological analysis, in my opinion, of um, abandoned Nazi industrial sites allows us to find, see a new dimension of their history, to create a new viewpoint and create uh, new knowledge about uh, those places. Um, those photographs which we analyze, historical photographs, surveillance photographs, uh, contain a great detail of information and many of those informations cannot be obtained from other sources. So we always have to reach uh, for those photographs if they are available. Uh, and in the case of deeply transformed landscapes, historical aerial photographs are often the last visual proof of certain events or existence of certain places. And among all those conclusions, the most important, in my opinion, is that historical aerial photographs can serve as heuristic tools. To what that means? That means that they allow us to connect within the one narration many different places that are often distant from each other but were in the past interrelated due to their historical purpose or, or reason why they were built. Um, and the last thing is that uh, today the site is quite a eclectic place, like I said, most of it is taken by ruins uh, of the old factory, but there are several small businesses in the corners of, of those ruins, and one of those uh, is just beside the museums, which I just showed you, and they produce their uh, plastic dinosaurs. Actually, right now it seems that this workshop is abandoned, so I can imagine that for the future archaeologists of a contemporary past, it may be quite a headache when they see those dinosaurs among the grassland. And that's all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for your attention.